And here, think about this. When you buy something that you don't have the money for, you are literally saying to God, mm -hmm. I am not content mm -hmm. with your provision for me, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it on my own. They've walked with the Lord a long time, and they begin to trust in their own strength to resist temptation. Now, in your book, uh, on page 152, you talked about there's sometimes times of testing when, when we don't hear him, and you say we need to trust in his silence. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, well, all through Scripture, you have uh, where God speaks to someone like Abraham and says, I'm going to call you to be the father of many nations. And Abraham was 75 years old. Well, 11 years later, when he's 86, nothing's happened. And as far as we know, there's no other interaction with God in him. But he has to trust. But he and his wife decide, well, we need to do something. And, of course, then they produce a child in the flesh. And that's the temptation from the time we hear God until God fulfills it, is for us to produce it in the flesh. And yet God wanted them simply to trust him. And so God spoke when he was 75, but he didn't fulfill his word till he was 100. So I try to encourage people, if you've heard the Lord and God's put something in your heart, don't get discouraged, but trust him until it comes to pass. So now after teaching on giving and extravagant giving and tithing and honoring the Lord first for over 30 years now, is there something new that God's still showing you, that He's still revealing to you through this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's amazing. People hear that we've given everything away, and actually, by God's grace, we've done that three times now. We've been able to give everything away. The other two times, we didn't feel like to give our house, but we were to give all the money we had and, every, you know, all the resources we had other than our home the other two times. Um, and so you'd think 30 years, you know, you're not learning anything new. But just a while back, there was a new translation of the Bible, and um, they needed um, uh, several hundred thousand dollars to complete this new translation. And uh, Pastor Jack Hayford uh, wanted the King's University to give that, but he was telling the board, um, I'll, I'll raise the money, but I want to do it through the King's University. And when he said that, I thought, well, we want to give. Gateway Church wants to give. So when I went to the elders about it, the elders said, let's just give all of it. Let's give every, every whatever, what the need is, let's just give it. So we wrote the check, and we did it through the King's University. So I'm the chairman of the board of the King's University, so I was standing there handing the, the Bible translators this check from the King's University as a representative of the Kings, and I had, I, I had this kind of sick feeling. And I thought, why am I having a sick feeling? And then it, it dawned on me. I thought, I'm giving this money from the King's University, but really it came from Gateway Church. And they don't even know that it came from Gateway Church. And it was almost like I was thinking, you know, I'm not really getting any credit for giving this money. And I felt like the Lord said to me, that's the way I feel all the time. That's the way I feel all the time, Robert. You go give money, and people tell you thank you, but actually the money came from me, and I don't get credit for it. And I remember thinking, after 30 years of teaching on this, God's taking me to a new level, you know, to give and not get any credit for it. So when you spoke for us a few years ago, you talked about the principle of first, yeah. and you called it the most important principle, not an important principle, the most important principle. Right. Why do you say that? Well, I say it for a few reasons. One is it's the most important principle that I feel like I can share that God put in my own life, obviously, other than accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior and things. Mm -hmm. And you can't compare it to how you're treating your spouse or prayer or something like that. But here's the reason I say it's the most important principle, because it's really the, the principle of putting God first. Yes. So it's not just the, the principle of tithing or, or tithing first. It's the, the principle of putting God first in every area of our life. And this is the reason tithing and finances are so important. Mm. Jesus himself said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Yeah. Uh, 16 out of 38 parables that Jesus taught have to do with money and possessions. Yeah. So we have to kind of ask ourselves: was Jesus after their money? No, he was after their hearts. Yes. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So the reason I say it's the most important principle that I could share with someone 
is because if I can get them to understand to put God first in their finances, according to Jesus, wherever they put their treasure, their heart's gonna follow. So if they begin putting their treasure in the church, then their heart's gonna be in the church and in the kingdom as well. Please, please hear me about this. Um, what, what I'm gonna share with you today, many mature believers fall into this trap. They've walked with the Lord a long time and they begin to trust in their own strength to resist temptation. Is it possible this is why King David fell? Because he was a very, very strong man. So, number one, pride is trusting in your own strength. By the way, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Uh, one time I was speaking to a group of young people, and I opened in this area about purity, and I opened up for questions and answers. And a very um, uh, a question came that was just a, a question that really exemplifies what a lot of young people feel. This person said to me, if we love each other and we're going to get married anyway, what difference does a piece of paper make? Now, I want you to notice, even how she phrased the question was letting me know how the, what the enemy was telling this young couple. In other words, he was trying, the enemy was trying to put the focus on a piece of paper. If we love each other and we're going to get married anyway, this is the lie the enemy tells people. What difference does a piece of paper make? Speaking of the marriage license. And here's what my answer was, none. None. The piece of paper that the license is written on makes no difference at all. It's not the piece of paper that makes the difference. It's the blessing of God that makes the difference. And when God tells us not to do something, it's not because he doesn't want us to have fun or he's approved. He doesn't want our lives destroyed. When we tell our children not to play in the street, it's not because we don't want them to have fun. It's because we want to save their lives because we want them to have fun. We want them to be around and alive long enough to have fun. So when God says flee sexual immorality, there's a reason. And I want to tell you what that reason is. All sexual immorality opens up the door to numerous sins. One of the sins would be deception. One is manipulation. One is lying. You have to sneak around for any type of sexual immorality. And so you open up a door to lying, to be, to, to be deceptive. David himself, when he was sexually immoral, then had to commit murder to try and cover it up. This gift that he asked me to give um, shocked me. It's, the most, it's very extravagant. Um, he said to me, would you give me your body? And I knew immediately what he meant by that. He meant eating right and exercising. And I have to tell you that my response to him was, I'd, I'd rather give you an extra 10%. <laughs> and I mean that. And so then I started saying to him, like, is this really you? Are you, are you saying, God, is this? And it was like it was silent. You know, it was like he was letting me. And, and then I said, God, are you serious? You know, are you, are you really asking me? I mean, Bluebell, are, are you serious, you know? <laughs> Come on, God. And, and I have to tell you, this has been a weakness in my life for a long time. And so uh, I remember thinking, well, you know, I wish the elders would mandate for me. You know, I, I really am submissive to the elders. They will tell you that. I, I, I started the church in my living room, and I set up the government we have because, and many, many churches don't do this, because I knew it was healthy. And it's one of the things that's healthy about Gateway Church is that the elders govern the church. I lead the church, but the elders govern. And I am submissive to the eldership. And I thought, you know, I, I wish they would just say to me, Robert, you know, for your schedule and what God's doing in your life, um, you're going to have to take care of your body better. So we are mandating that you eat right and that you get on an exercise program. And then I say, well, you know, I have to do this, you know. All right, here's what I realized this last week. No one's going to do it except me. The reason I'm telling you that is because it's your choice. This is not a matter of whether you go to heaven or hell. That's, that's grace and receiving Jesus as your Savior. This is a matter, though, of whether you can fulfill the mission that God has for you on your life. 
and whether you will be here to impart to your family and how well you can fulfill the mission God has on your life and how well you can impart to your family. Your body affects your spirit and your soul. Got an, an, another great book. Take the day off. This is a big deal. So what are, you, what are you implying and what do you want us to get right up front? Take the day off. Okay, I'll go straight to it. I, I, uh, this is uh, really about the fourth commandment. You know, God came out with a top 10 list before David Letterman or any of those comedians <laughs> on TV. And uh, he said, these are my top 10 principles so you can have a better life. And I want people to understand that because God wasn't saying, listen, if you'll start acting right, I'll set you free from bondage. They were in bondage to the Egyptians. Here's God's grace. I'll set you free. And now, now I'll give you principles where you can have a better relationship with me and a better relationship with other people. And he said you get to stay a long time in this fruitful land. That's exactly that right. Just they flows were all with of them milk for, and honey. They were for our benefit. Yeah, exactly. Not committing adultery is for our benefit. Not lying <laughs> yeah. is for our benefit. Yeah. Because it hurts us and it hurts mm -hmm. people around us. Right. Not stealing is for our benefit. But here's the problem. The fourth commandment, which is the longest commandment, about remember the Sabbath day, for it is a day of rest, is what it says. But I'm going to shock you. I'm a pastor. But the fourth commandment does not say anything about going to church. <laughs> Nothing. Now, I believe we should go to church. Y'all keep coming to church, okay? <laughs> I believe that. But it doesn't say anything about coming to church. It says rest. And the word Sabbath actually means cease from labor. And he says, I don't want you working. I don't want your wife working. I don't want any of your servants working. And he, he even says, I don't even want your cows working. He doesn't even want your cows working wow. one day a week. <laughs> Be, and it says, because God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested, now here's a big one, and was refreshed. Mm -hmm. And yet God gave us a gift of a day off every week. And he, here's what he says, I'll take, I'll take care of your work. I'll take care of it. Just trust me. And yet we don't evaluate, we don't uh, take advantage of this gift that God's given us. And one other thing about the commandments, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's no way I could talk you. I've known you again 40 years. There's no way I could talk you into breaking any of the other Ten Commandments. You couldn't. I couldn't. The enemy I could would not. try to. I, the I, deceiver yeah, would. Yeah, yeah, I could. Yeah, the deceiver would. would. But I couldn't talk you into no. uh, telling a lie. No, You'd say, that's not, not right, Pastor no. Robert. I'm not going to do that. I couldn't talk you into stealing, committing adultery, murder. I couldn't talk you into that. I might, might have talked Patty into it a few times, you know, in your case. But, <laughs> but, but you've gotten better. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I couldn't talk you into taking God's name in vain. You wouldn't right. do something no. like that. But even you and I sometimes don't rest one day a week. Yeah. It's like the only commandment that we as Christians don't think we should keep. So I want to give you four things to do when you're under attack, all right? So remember these four things, all right? Number one, recognize that you're in a battle. Recognize you're in a battle. You're not just sad. You don't just have some sad emotions or sad memories. You are in a battle. Look at verse 3, Psalm 42, verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night while they, they, now I'm going to come back to they in a moment. Continually say to me, where is your God? Notice the words they. Okay, we need to know who they are. And I'm going to show you who they are in this scripture. But I don't know if y'all have noticed, but they get blamed for a lot of things. You know, I hear all the time, someone will say something, I'll say, well, where'd you hear that? They say it. Or, or maybe you hear this. You know, they don't make things like they used to. Who are they? Okay, well... David's going to tell us who they are in this verse, all right? Verses 9 and 10, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the breaking of my bones, my enemies, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? That's exactly what the enemy does. David had literal enemies. We have spiritual enemies. Here's what they say. Where's God? Where's your God? Look what you're going through. You have served God, and now this person that you love has passed away. You've served God, and now you've lost your job. You've served God. You've lost your marriage. You've served God. Where's your God? That's the way Satan is. So you need to recognize you're in a battle. You're in a spiritual battle. I want to teach you a phrase 
that I hope you'll learn to use this phrase when you're in a battle. It's a great phrase. It's from Zechariah 3 and Jude verse 9. The Lord rebuke you. When Satan is coming against you, say to him, the Lord rebuke you. Hello, everybody. And I'm Mr. Sears. We have been working, spending many hours to give the best for you. And I really hope that you enjoyed this series. Don't forget to subscribe and like. Also, share with your friends. So that's the way you're going to bless our brothers and sisters. And we're going to give encourage to me to keep it going this series. Thank you. Yes. Is that you're not supposed to covet mm -hmm. what right. your neighbor has. Right. Right. And what that does is our neighbor's got a new house. We need a new house. They got a new car. We need a new car. And it causes you not to be content, content. with right. what God has given you. And here, think about this. When you buy something that you don't have the money for, you are literally saying to God, mm -hmm. I am not content mm -hmm. with your provision for me, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. wow. And I think God, in his love, says, okay, great, do it on your own. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead. Now, he's not doing that to hurt us or yeah. even punish us because Jesus took our punishment. But he wants us to then come to place to say, you know what, I don't want to do it on my own anymore. Right. I'd like to do it your way. Yes. And then he can line things up. He's a God of order. He's not a God of confusion. The whole universe, when Satan fell the earth, it became a place of confusion. God comes in and immediately puts things in order. Mm -hmm. And when he puts things in order and we put things in order, then the blessing can come. That's right. You know, one of the Good. things you say in your book is you'll never fulfill the destiny that God has for you. Uh, if you don't get your finances in order. Right. That's, That's, That's a true. pretty big yep. statement right there because we just think, we know people in ministry that just, God's called me and then they just, but they, they, they take no thought of how they're going to do it or the finances that are, are yeah. considered. Yeah, and Jesus again, he said, you know, uh, who, who would start to build something without counting the cost? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's Jesus himself mm -hmm. saying that. Yeah. And then you've and got 16. And even use the analogy of a tower because, you know, we're in TV. That's right. So count the cost there before you, you build the we tower. Build the tower. That's it. <laughs> uh, so I, now I'll bet Marcus might have seen that. Yeah, you know, totally. Cause. Yeah, he's the. He's, yeah, but even, sixteen out of thirty-eight parables have to do with money and possessions. Mm -hmm. This so is true. Jesus. So yeah. almost half of his sermons. Think about if you went to a church, and ha almost half the pastor's sermons he talked about money and possessions. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to go to Jesus' church. Yeah. But why would he do that? It's because he knows that that is such a stronghold right. that once we can get that area under control, we can get the rest of the areas under control. Yes. And it's so many times we even talk about stewarding our time, our energy, yeah. our physical bodies, all those things, and those need to be stewarded. Mm -hmm. But I've seen those just fall into order when people get their finances in order because where your treasure is, yes. Yes. there your heart will yes. be. <laughs> Most people believe that parazim means breakthrough. Uh, it's close to that, but it's not quite that. Here's what I, though, I couldn't understand for a long time. Baal is the Philistine god. Baal pairs them. It sounds like this is where Baal had a breakthrough. Why didn't he name it Jehovah pairs them? This is where Jehovah, the Israel God, the true God, broke through. Here's the reason why. Pairs them doesn't really mean breakthrough. It means broken through. <laughs> Here's what David was saying. I want all of my enemies to know this is where Baal was broken through. This is where there was a stronghold. It was a valley of the giants, Rephaim, but it had a mountain on the edge of that valley. You know what they called that? Mount Baal. It says that they gathered all their gods up and David burned them. Do you know how they gathered them up? It says they left their gods there. You know why they left them there? That was a place of worship. Here's what I'm telling you. The enemy camped there against David. Why? Because the enemy thought this is our stronghold. This is a place that we can't lose. Okay, here's the word that I feel. I told you I feel like I have a prophetic message for all of us and for each of us. Here's the message I feel like I have for you from the Lord. If we'll pray and obey, the place in your life where the enemy thinks he has the strongest hold it's the place God will give you a breakthrough this year. Whatever area of your life that is, where the enemy thinks this is the stronghold, and you know what? You might even think that too. I'm telling you there is not a place where our God can't break through. There's not one place. 
And here's what we're going to do. Our theme for this year is pray and obey. Now, we talked about giving. Yes, in the area of giving, I want you to pray and obey. But I want you to pray and obey in every area of your life. Just pray, spend time in prayer, and whatever God says, do it. And watch God break through your enemies. <laughs> the things that we do for the kingdom, it's not because we're big. It's not because we're talented. It's by His Spirit. Here's the secret to everything that we've been able to accomplish for the kingdom, and we have a lot more to accomplish. We pray and we obey. Well, I want to welcome you. This is the first service of Gateway Church. We started attending Gateway all the time. We're like, why have we never heard this before? God came so he could have a personal relationship. We declare the purpose of this building will be to reach people in this community. The work of ministry that will take place in this building. Gateway will rise up and be the church you dreamed of. Let it be, Lord, the house of God and the gateway to heaven. What I do know is that the Lord is real, and He changed me, and I'm not the person that I was. It's not about the buildings. It's about people.